After a bunch of rallies, et cetera, that, you know, what's next? I mean, you can't just keep rallying and protesting, make a lot of noise in the streets and the squares, et cetera. We need to sue something that's impactful, and we discovered precinct organizing, did a lot of research, and, and we then decided to put up a website to teach the conservative movement how to do precinct organizing and leverage the, the power of the Tea Party, harness that power for political effect. There's a lot of material we're going to be covering this afternoon. Uh, in order not to get writer's cramp, all of the content is on our website. The Road to Serfdom. How many of you have heard of The Road to Serfdom? Okay, a few people. It's an excellent book. I'd recommend you all get a free copy of this. He is a theoretical economist. He, he later on went, uh, went on to win a Nobel Prize in e e economics. Uh, so he knew what he was talking about. But in the 40, in 44, he specifically wrote this book to warn the British about what happened in Germany. And if you go down this path that the Germans went down, you may end up with the same end result. And it is not a pretty end result, okay? Bec and it was based all on economics and the dynamics of politics, etc. And, and, and this is just a synopsis of, of basically how that road works. There's a lot of spending, there's a lot of debt by the politicians, the loss of jobs, increased dependency on government. I mean, just think about what is going on today. We are living this road. Tax and redistribution. Tax the wealthy, redistribute to everybody else. Equality, social justice starts popping up along with the tax and redistribution. Rules and regulations, bureaucracy. Lots of bureaucracy, ever-growing bureaucracy to make more and more rules to, with, with the utopian goal of creating social justice. A creation of a government, corporate elite, and everyone else becomes a serf to the to this elite. So, and, and, the, and you lose the freedom. I mean, in essence, you will end up working for the government elite who redistribute your money and you get to keep, you know, for your living sustenance. So we're on that road. And this is why the Tea Party emerged because they woke up. The silent majority, I mean, this is really motivating when we go around the country. I mean, they're informed, knowledgeable, passionate people. It's the silent majority has awakened and realizing the game that's been played by the political elite, big government elite. And, you know, they say history repeats itself. Well, we are witnessing such a re repetition. Now, there's another book which I read. I don't recommend reading this one because it's, it's, uh, it's very tedious to read. A lot of facts in it, but the death of money. But I wanted to read more about what my parents as children experienced during the Weimar Republic. And how, does, how did the German Deutschmark literally die? Again, we are experiencing this very phenomena today. The Deutschmark was worthless, okay? I mean, we all see these pictures of guys with wheelbarrows going to buy a loaf of bread and all this kind of stuff. How can that happen? Well, we're, we are literally watching it happen today in this country. Politicians in Germany did not know how to make cuts. And they figure making cuts is very difficult. People are going to scream in the streets, they're going to protest, and we cannot afford to do that. It's a whole lot easier just to print money. The masses are too stupid to realize what that does. Just start the printing press and start shipping money out. And, 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 and the result of it was, of course, in the end, hyperinflation and the death of the, the German mark. But not everyone in German society suffered. Well, who didn't suffer? Well, it was government employees. They had their salary indexed almost on a daily basis. So high inflation doesn't bother me if it's a thousand percent, as long as I get more, a thousand percent more salary-wise tomorrow than I did yesterday, okay? Related with the government, same thing. Big business didn't suffer. Actually, they profited. So what you had in Germany during the Weimar Republic was big unions, big corporations, and big government working against the people who lost. Small business, middle class, fixed income people lost everything. They were totally wiped out.
Over 200 years ago, George Washington foretold this very dynamic. This is his Farwell address. I mean, it's just amazing how smart our founding fathers were in, in terms of understanding political dynamics and, and the evils of mankind, in essence. Cunning, ambitious, unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government. We have arrived at such a moment. He foretold us. So, that's kind of, I just wanted to kind of set the tone of why are we here and why each one of you need to get involved. And each one of you need to make sure your neighbors, your friends, your relatives all get involved. The question is what to do. Where, what's the most productive use of our time? You know? Uh, and that's what neighborhood precinct organizing is all about. That's what this presentation is about. And please, each and every one of you, pay attention to this presentation with a mindset that you're going to go home and you're going to do what we're talking about. Because it's easy, it's doable, and will have a tremendous impact. And this is the, 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 the well-kept secret that the conservatives, the Tea Partiers, don't really fully understand. So I'm going to be talking about, you know, what's the role in politics of organizing neighborhoods, precincts, there's a unique opportunity here that's only here because of the Tea Party. The GOP is not leveraging the existence of the Tea Party. They are using an old playbook and they're not using the new capabilities that have just been introduced that are sitting on the sideline. They're not bringing them on the field and playing with them. They're not using the volunteers and they're not using the very broad principled accepted message of the Tea Party of limited government, free markets, and individual liberty. The Tea Party can leverage its own existence outside of the party system. Then how you focus your efforts and have an election impact with precinct organizing. We'll talk about the components and then how individually you can get started because it's very easy. Role in politics. Like I said, you know, we, we started protests and these were good, okay? We needed to have the rallies. First of all, finding out we're, we weren't alone with the frustration, with the concern. We weren't the only one in the silent majority waking up and realizing, hey, there's something fundamentally wrong here with the direction this country is going in. And, and we learned a lot. But, you know, just like in sports, in sports you have pep rallies, right? So those were like pep rallies for the Tea Party. But you can't keep having pep rallies one after another. You need to start playing the game. So I'm, like in football, you know, as the Steelers are doing right now, they're on the field playing the game. That's how you win the game. You don't win it with pep rallies. Now in politics, the only way you can win is through precinct organizing. We call it neighborhood organizing. Others call it community organizing, which we've heard before, right? This is what wins the game in politics. And, and, and simply stated, neighborhood organizing, precinct organizing, is nothing more than identifying like-minded neighbors in your neighborhood and making sure they vote. That's it, as simple as that. Now you can do, use the methodology, grow your organization. We know a lot of organizations that have used the, the, the concept to grow their organization, to gain political influence, but in the end of the day, it's all about we want to win elections and this is how you win elections. And the components are actually, actually quite simple. You start out with a voter record from your board of election. This is uh, in a public domain, and I'll talk more about that. You go door to door, or you make volunteer phone calls. That's how you contact your neighbors, or you have socials in your neighborhood. To get out the vote. It's written by two Yale professors who statistically analyzed what really works in the game of politics. Money and lobbying cannot buy what neighborhood and precinct organizing can do. That's the conclusion. You know, if you look at context per vote, this, this is scientific statistical analysis, okay? Context per vote, one knock on the door, going to your neighbor's door and talking with that person and trying to find out who's like-minded, has the same effect as 28 mailers to that same household and 33 phone calls to that same household. Now, if you want to spend your time effectively and efficiently to get people to out to vote, where would you spend your time? You'd do it going door to door, wouldn't you? Not making phone calls 
or sending mailers. That's all very expensive stuff, particularly these high gloss mailers the party sends us, right? But this, this is why neighborhood and precinct organizing is so effective, going door to door to find like-minded people. Now, this is not like a new revelation either. Uh, in 1946, Heinlein wrote a book, Take Back Your Government. That was right after the Roosevelt area. So, based on his political experience, you know, wrote, remember at all times, the votes are in a precinct, club meetings are primarily to arouse and hold together your volunteers, Rally are from, rallies are for morale building, it isn't hard to get adherence to your cause, volunteer campaigns should not cost much. The left, like I said, they, they've recognized this all along. They do it very well. Uh, here's Howard Dean. He was a tremendous advocate in 2006 when, when the Democrats took over the House. They, they, they spent a lot of time in, in really increasing precinct organizing or organizing, community organizing. And here he is, uh, election by election, state by state, precinct by precinct, door by door, vote by vote. We're going to lift our party up and take this country back for the people who built it. This is Williamson County in Texas. That was a predominant Republican county. 92 precincts total, two precincts went to the Democrat. In just two years, 2004, 2006, the focus Howard Dean put on organizing and getting people to go door to door, of the 92 precincts, almost a third went to the Democrats. Doing basically what we're gonna teach you how to do today. Very simple and very effective. But why doesn't the GOP do this? Well, the GOP has a problem of where do we get these volunteers? So the campaign managers have basically given up. They didn't know how to get mobilize these, these volunteers. There's a movement in the Tea Party, let's, let's get more involved in the GOP and become precinct committee chairman and all this kind of stuff. Why is that in the, for the GOP? Well, because they don't do anything. So why do I need someone to represent a precinct, be a precinct captain, to be part of the GOP you know, party apparatus if there's nothing for them to do? So they've given up on that because they don't know how to get all these volunteers. And this is why I say, you know, they're not leveraging the existence of motivated, informed volunteers called the Tea Party. Okay, we suddenly exist. That's a new capability, but they don't know how to deploy it. Unlike the Democrats who have SEIU, got ACORN, they've got a lot of money that's, that's been flowing their way, which they can disperse. They pay, you know, reasonable uh, hourly rates for people to go door to door. Now, what the GOP instead focuses on is mass advertising. These are the mailers, okay? They get out the vote, 28 mailers to the household, they equal one knock on the door. Centralized phone banks, 33 phone calls to the household, they equal one knock on the door. And centralized mail campaigns, oh, and mass advertising, I'm sorry. Uh, so advertising, centralized phone banks, centralized mail campaigns, oh, by the way, campaign managers get a cut on all of the money that flows into all of these. Campaign managers don't make a lot of money rallying volunteers doing this kind of stuff right here that we're doing today, okay? Not a lot of money in it, and it's tough. It's like herding cats at times, right? So, so why bother? Let's just forget that and just focus on getting money. This is why the GOP is after us all the time. Send us money, send us money, send us money, okay? Whereas now the Democrats do the same thing, but they spend it a whole lot more wisely by doing more precinct or community organizing. The Tea Party is a new element, it's not being leveraged. Do this precinct neighborhood organizing outside of the party. Ignore the party, let them do their stuff, you do your organizing, and you become a force that the parties have to deal with, okay? And by being a nonpartisan organizer, you'll be able to recruit independents and the more conservative Democrats. You have to understand, we go to Cleveland, Ohio, 30% of our audience are Democrats. That's a heavy unionized area, okay? There are a lot of Democrats in the audience. And I joke a lot of times, you know, John F. Kennedy Democrats are to the right of the Republican Party. And if you think about it and look at it factually in a principled way, you will realize that's true. John F. Kennedy Democrats are to the right of the Republican Party. They have a lot more in common with the Tea Party principles than the GOP does today. So let's talk about the Tea Party SWOT analysis. When you do strategy development, you, you, you do SWOT analysis. And basically it talks about strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. Okay, just a way to compartmentalize where am I? And, and based on an assessment of where you are, you then develop a strategy going forward to accomplish your goal. 
So our goal is we want to affect politics. We want to have an impact, a maximum impact. And how do we do that? Well, let's look at a SWOT analysis. Well, for the Tea Party, SWOT analysis is the strength that we have a lot of informed, passionate volunteers. The weakness is we lack funding. But gee, Heinlein in 1946 already discovered precinct organizing, neighborhood organizing, community organizing doesn't take a lot of money. It's very easy to do. Elections are won locally in the precincts with votes. And we can do precinct organizing, which is inexpensive, so we don't have to worry about the weakness and get the job done. The threat is we don't have enough candidates who adhere to the Tea Party principles. Well, that can change, okay? In primaries, for example, the Tea Party needs to advocate those candidates in the parties who more closely yeah, are aligned with the Tea Party principles. It's as simple as that. And he keep doing that and doing that. And so, you know, in, in one sense, by being an independent movement and force outside the party, you can align with the parties where it makes sense and you can work against the party anointed candidates where, where it doesn't make sense, okay? So it gives you a lot of flexibility and it's, the power is with the people, where it resides, where it should be, okay? This is the constitutional principles of limited government. Push everything down to the local level as much as possible. It's interesting, Napoleon would say the morale going into a battle is to the physical in war as three is to one. Okay, so emotions, just like in football, it's a very emotional game. Emotions count for a lot as opposed to the physical conditioning in all of this, okay? So Napoleon says three to one. Heinlein, based on his political experience, said it's more like 10 to one. Well, what does that mean? The Tea Party is very passionate. We're, we are very emotional. So we are very powerful. We, can, we are a force to be dealt with, okay? We don't have to be within the party. We can stay outside the party, focus on precinct organizing, and become nationally a very powerful force. And we showed that force already in 2010. The governor of Ohio would not be there today, the governor Kasich, GOP, if it hadn't been for the Tea Party, because the GOP did not want him to become a governor. The Tea Party helped elect him. The party insiders did not want him to be governor. They wanted Governor Strickland from the opposing party to have another four-year term and do the damage he did to Ohio jobs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and then bring in their anointed one. The silent majority is really moderates, conservatives. There are 76% of us who are probably much more like-minded than the 20% who are liberal and who believe in big government, et cetera. The problem is those 20% have been a lot more vocal and active than the other 76%. That's been our problem, shame on us, okay? We've not been involved. But the silent majority has awakened. You know, the sleeping giant, the Tea Party, called this Tea Party has awakened. Now here's the other element. So I talk about the volunteers, that's one power. This is an important one, the messaging, okay? Now Fabiola talked about all those candidates and so on. It could get very complex, okay? All those candidates, who's running for what office? Now going around, precinct organizing, who do I talk about, advocate, etc. You don't need to do that, trust me. And this is again where the Republican Party is using an old playbook and not leveraging the new capability. Because all we need to do is find like-minded people who believe in the same principles as you do. Limited government, free markets, individual liberties, and make sure they go out and vote for the right candidates. Well, how do you then inform people who to vote for? Well, you're telling them, vote for candidates who believe in these principles, educate yourself, and most of the like-minded people will tend to educate themselves, but we can facilitate that, and that's what Warren is going to talk about, candidate town halls, and nonpartisan voter guides. As simple as that. You can cover many more candidates that way if, if you go at mobilizing like-minded voters to go out and vote at election day than going around on a per-candidate basis. And it's sustainable. So since you're creating this We the People movement in your neighborhood, you're creating a movement that stands for these principles. It's sustainable from election to election. Candidates will come and go, issues come and go, and 
So you just keep going. You just keep growing your We the People movement and power in your neighborhoods and, and, and make sure they're educated. They know how the candidates stand on the core principles that you believe in through nonpartisan literature and a lot of benefits associated with that. I would encourage everybody to go to our website. Under talking points, there's one sub-tab called economic principles. And a lot of it is based on the church and the market, a Catholic defense of the free economy. I would encourage you to read that. It's just one page. I would say even print it out, have it handy. Because it will arm you with a lot of economic principles that will help you in your discussions with people. And, and it teaches you all of the economic principles, but it also shares with you perspective. This is shocking. That the lower percentile in our economy in terms of their, their standard of living is higher than the average standard of living in Sweden, the epitome of socialism in Europe. Just think about that. The standard of living of the lowest economic class in the United States today is higher than the average standard of living in all of Sweden. That's what socialism gets you. This, this is, is stunning revelations. But yet you've got people talking about we need government, big government, we need a nanny state, we need social justice, etc. The facts defy all of that, that talk. Tea Party messaging. Here's the good news. Again, the GOP ignores all this good news that's, that's, that's with the Tea Party. In addition to all these volunteers, the Tea Party message of limited government, free markets, individual liberties, 70, 80 percent of the people polled in this country already subscribe to that set of principles. So they agree. Why not leverage the fact that there's so many independents and Democrats out there in addition to Republicans who agree with the Tea Party principles? Messaging is done. End of discussion. See, in politics, you win by two lever points. One is messaging, the other is getting out the vote. So those two work hand in hand. The Tea Party message is agreed to by 70 to 80 percent of the population in this country across party lines. Why not leverage that? And then find those people in your neighborhood, those 70, 80 percent, and that's what I'm going to be teaching you as well, find those people and make sure they vote. Game over. We win every election. I can promise you that. We showed already uh, with, with, with the uh, amount of precinct organizing in 2010 how effective that is. So the nonpartisan message, and this is it too, it's a nonpartisan message. It's a principled message. You're not going around as a party you know, operative. Uh, it's just like, I have principles. Do you have those principles? Are you concerned about the, you know, us being bankrupt, etc.? Nonpartisan uh, flyer, for example, doesn't have to be really all that soft. It can be pretty hard hitting. Just look at this. This is totally nonpartisan because you're not for a party, okay? I stand for principles, okay? And I'm telling people to go out and vote who believe, for candidates who believe in those principles. And then you can present factual information. Facts are facts, right? You can give a report card on the State of the Union. If you want accountability, you look at the report card, it's like we need to get other people in there and give them a shot at it. In terms of getting out the vote, the statistical analysis by, done, uh, done by these Yale professors proves that it really doesn't matter when you go door to door if you're partisan or nonpartisan, it's the same effect. So why go partisan? Why go for a specific candidate? Just make sure you find those like-minded people who believe in the Tea Party principles, even though they may not belong to a Tea Party. That's okay. They don't have to belong. Just find out if they're like-minded, and then make sure they vote. And it has the same effect as if a partisan goes door-to-door, -door, and I would maintain today it's probably even more effective because you're not a partisan. People tend to get turned off by, ah, you're, okay, you're this party, that party. Uh, and, of course, Jefferson said, you know, a well-informed people can be trusted. So make sure you vote for people who stand for principles, and then you use candidate now as voter guides to find out where they are relative to those principles. How you focus that effort and, and impact elections, because you may very well be sitting there saying, my God, you know, this guy's asking me to knock on a thousand doors in my neighborhood, you know, I don't have that kind of time or energy. It's easy. It's amazing how easy this is once you really you know, scientifically approach this process and think about it.
and you have about 1,000 to 1,300 people per precinct, okay? So you say, wow, 1,000, 1,300 doors you want me to knock on? No. Only 80% register to vote, okay? 60% only vote in midterm general elections, and during primaries, only 30%. This is why neighborhood precinct organizing works, because not enough people go out and vote. They need some encouragement, and you can be that encouragement in your neighborhood. In a general congressional district, 231 votes per precinct will win that district. So if you take all the precincts in a district, there's 650 precincts generally in a district, uh, you get 231 votes per precinct, and you will win that precinct. So already, we've taken you from 1,000 to 1,300 voters, eligible voters in a given precinct, down to 231 doors you need to knock on. It gets even better from here, because if I got clobbered in an election, 60-40, so I ran against someone, okay, and I lost, I got 40%, the other person got 60% of votes. If you run the numbers, you will find out, if I can change 46 voters' mind next time around, I win. The point being here, it's, the numbers are very small in a precinct level. Now, again, Organizing for America understood all of this. The left has understood this all along. If we had 10 more votes per precinct that went Democrat, they could win those, those states. And here's 50 more. And there are many more slides. They had, they had all, this, all the states. So we're talking tens to hundreds of, of voters that, that we need to get out to vote and we can win. And as I said earlier, there are many more of us than them. The numbers are with our side. We've got 76%. If we can just mobilize you know, a significant number of that 76%, their 20% will be overwhelmed each and every election. One vote per precinct, one Jimmy Carter in Ohio. In Florida, look, 537 votes in Florida made the election for Bush. This is very powerful. Now, now we'll start zeroing in, okay, how do I focus my energies? Now that I understand, okay, I think I can deal with the numbers he's asking me to deal with in my very own neighborhood, okay? How do I find the people or target people? I won't even ask you to go to every door. I'm going to ask you to go only to people who are likely to be like-minded, okay? So I'm stacking a deck for you. Can I make it real easy? Because I don't want you to get in a debate, in a heavy discussion, bother people who don't want to be bothered. I want you to go to people who are likely to be like-minded, and make sure they go out and vote. That's it. Maybe you can also ask them if they're really passionate about, you know, the, the principles and all that, and they're not already joining your organization, have them join your organization. You can do other stuff during the year to be, be a political force, okay? But at the end of the day, when game time comes around, election time, you make sure they vote. It's simple as that. Now, how do I find people who are likely to be like-minded? Now, you get this off the voter record, okay? You can find out how, which party people are, uh, I mean, people are stunned at what's available in the public domain about voting, okay? Uh, but a voter record that's available to anyone from the boards of election will tell you what party you registered with and when you voted. It doesn't say how you voted once you entered the, the, the polling place, but it says what party you registered with. So I pretty much guess how you vote if you're a registered Democrat or Republican. And I can also see how frequently you vote, okay? Primaries, general elections, regular basis, you know, irregular. You don't focus on always vote Democrats. You don't focus on people who never vote. They might be registered, but they never bother going and vote, okay? So that's their gig. Uh, why bother with Republicans who always go and vote? You pretty much have a sense of how they're gonna vote, okay? Particularly in general elections. Certainly in primaries, it's a little different game, okay? but I'm primarily focusing on general election. Who you focus on is really, it's a third of the total, but this really depends on the makeup of your precinct, your neighborhood, okay? If it's skewed Democrat, skewed Republican, skewed independent, so it's not really a third, just depends, okay? In the precinct I need to focus on, and it's the independents, the swing voters, so, and it's the, the independents who always vote, and the independents who sometimes vote, and then the Republicans who are fair weather voters. They don't always go out and vote. So you just want to make sure they, from now on, will always go and vote, okay? And you get all this information, like I said, off the voter records. You know, you, you can read people's names, uh, when they were born, where they live, 
uh, their city. So I, need, I can find out from a publicly available voter record for my precinct everything I need to know to go out and seek out like, likely like-minded voters in my neighborhood, okay? Without being a threat of being turned down, door slammed in my face, that kind of stuff, okay? Very easy. And then I can organize them, I can get them to join the, the 912 Tea Party organization and make sure they go out and vote. Now here's a real live example of what these numbers mean in terms of winning election. In my precinct, 647 people actually voted and 135 were Democrats, 287 independent, 226 Republican. I, I can assume, you know, I need 324 votes to win, right? I need over half of that. And I got 226 Republicans so I only need 98 of 287 independents. So that's all I need to focus on, right? In a, in a very simplistic way. And oh, by the way, there are 137 unregistered voters who might be adult children living with kids, et cetera, who may be like-minded, okay? All I gotta do is find them, get them to register, and then make sure they vote. So the point of this slide is in a general election, because not everyone votes, and notice this is about 60%, of a thousand. Okay. The numbers are quite small in terms of who I need to focus on in that precinct to make sure my candidate wins. It gets even e easier in a precinct and this is where we can get the, the, the candidates you know, who are not the big government candidates but are more closely aligned with our limited government, free markets, individual liberties, we can get them elected in primaries because look at this. Uh, Democrats, only 68 showed up in my precinct of a thousand. 68 actual voters showed up. So I need 35 votes to win the Democratic primary. 35 voters. I mean, this is incredible. See, this is a well kept secret. How powerful organizing your neighborhood really is to win elections. And this is the only thing you can really do have, to have an impact in politics and policy, nonviolent thing, okay? Republicans, same thing. 113 voters showed up out of the thousand, okay? Or out of the 301 who were actually registered. You know, 37.5% actually showed up to vote in that primary. So I need 57 votes to win that precinct for my, you know, conservative candidate. Sometimes organizations will say, you know, we'll try to coordinate it from a higher level and, 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 uh, and direct resources uh, from precinct to precinct. Uh, and, and these slides speak to that, and they're in the slides that you can download as well. Because what you do then is you, say you take a uh, congressional district, what you do is you slice that congressional district into thirds. A thir the top third based on conservatism, the mid third evenly split, and then the liberal third, okay? And, and then, based on those thirds, you then allocate your resources. Before election time, what you do, you spend most of your time going door-to-door -door canvassing, volunteer phone calls, robocalls, in the most liberal part, assuming you're conservative, okay? You're actually spending most of your time there in a more education, nonpartisan, educational way, okay? You're trying to find the like-minded voters in the, the more liberal precincts in the congressional district. But when it, time, it gets time to get out to vote, you focus, you flip that around, and you focus on the most conservative precincts in the congressional districts or whatever district you're focusing on. You focus more of the energies there to get them out to vote. Because again, it's all about statistics and probabilities. And how do I find out the makeup of my precincts? It's very easy. You go to your election results that are available from your Secretary of State, uh, and you can look by precinct how they voted and the race you want to look at which is most partisan is a secretary of state race. The secretary of state races generally speaking are not about the candidates it's all about the party. Okay, So people tend to go and vote for the secretary of state of the party that they are most closely aligned with. And So if you look at the secretary of state race results from the last election you can then you know, use that fraction and it'll tell you how the various precincts are skewed in your 
uh, various districts. And, and by the way, you know, I mean, our talk is generally focused on congressional districts, Senate races, you know, federal Senate races. The lower you go to the local level, the more powerful this method becomes. The, re the simple reason for that is the, 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 the smaller campaigns, say school board, mayor, etc., even, uh, you know, the house, the state house, etc., they don't have a lot of resources. They don't have a lot of people, volunteers, they don't have a lot of money. We as a Tea Party with, you know, are much larger uh, than they are. And to the extent we're organized in our respective neighborhoods, and we can mobilize those people to vote for the principal candidates that are most closely aligned with our principles, we win. We can affect all those. We can take back the school boards. We can take back, uh, you know, the, the various uh, local uh, elections. Matter of fact, Tea Party Patriots put out a slide set, which I, I found fascinating. I included two slides here. Because they looked at Iowa and said, look, uh, state house, the average margin to win a state house is 726 votes. First of all, it just reinforces what I've been telling you all along. The numbers are not that big. So every vote you get out at election day will have an impact. And oh, by the way, then they looked at how many tea parties are we aware of in the state house on average across Iowa in those state house districts. Well, we got 1,500 votes that are Tea Party people we know of and we can mobilize. Like I said, you can win these elections. I mean, the Tea Party is a powerful force. Same thing with state Senate primaries. Average margin is 931 votes. Now let's talk about the components. So hopefully by now I've, I've, I've uh, given you a sense of the Tea Party has volunteers. They've got a strong message that's broadly accepted. You've gotten a sense that the numbers are very reasonable. It's very doable for each and every one of you in your neighborhood to do this, okay? Basically, it comes down to basically covering, uh, if you have six volunteers working with you, each one of you covers 40 to 60 homes. That's it. It's 40 to 60 households that you knock on. That's it. That's very manageable. That's two hours, three, two to three hours that you, that, that you, that, that, that you commit to the movement and that's what it takes to knock on that many, 40 homes, two hours, okay? Easy as that. So let's talk about those components. So you go door to door. The point is, this is not a debating club. You're not going out to debate, to argue, to convince anyone of anything. You're only there to knock on a door to find out, is that household indeed like-minded? You already stacked the deck because of the taking the voter record and creating a walking list only focusing on the independents and the sometime vote Republicans. You stack the deck. Now all you're doing is confirming that those people are really like-minded. And then you get their contact information, you know, like email, phone number, etc. Ask them to join the organization. You knock on the door and you say, look, I'm a neighbor of yours. I'm concerned about these big government politicians bankrupting us our children and our grandchildren. Is that a concern of yours? They either say yes. Well, they're like-minded if they say yes. If they say, I don't quite understand, well, maybe then you clarify, okay. Or they say, no, it doesn't bother me. I'm not concerned at all. I think everything is great. In which case you say, thank you very much. Sorry to have bothered you, okay. But what you will find is 90% of the time, since you stack the deck, and based on national polling, I already told you, 70, 80% of the general population, including Democrats, agree with us. Now you stack the deck. 90 plus percent of the people whose door you knock on will be like-minded. They're going to appreciate what you're doing. Some of them will join the organization and they will go out and vote. And you will continue to make sure they go out and vote because of follow-up. But anyway, that's all you do. So you engage them as, I'm a concerned citizen. You educate them. Maybe they don't know about the voting date, polling location, voter registration. Uh, you request contact information. So this is not a dreaded cold call. Most people are afraid to do this, OK? I mean, to be quite honest, this is like, you know, I'm not very good in those kind of things. You know, I would have become a salesperson if, if I were good at this stuff, so no. I, 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 I don't like this. My wife was like that, okay? She said, 
this in 2010. She said, I'll go around with you. I'm very supportive of what you're doing, you know, and all this kind of stuff, but I'm not going to knock on the door. So I'll, t I'll, I'll just go there and, you know, so I knocked on the door, did my thing. Within an hour, she said, you know what, give me the other side of the street numbers. I'll do it over there. You stay over here. This is real easy. It's a lot of fun because these people thank you. They thank you literally from their heart that you're doing this. And a lot of them say, we've been bouncing off our walls, frustrated with what's going on, no idea what to do. Now we're seeing you're doing this, and this is, I can do this. And I didn't know there was a Tea Party around, or a 912 organization, or as a mom organization, you name it. I wasn't aware there was it in my neighborhood. I keep hearing about these guys and so on. And uh, so they join the organization. It's a very satisfying experience. F volunteer phone banks. Okay. Now, now here's the difference. Why am I even talking about phone banking when I just told you it takes 33 phone calls equal one door knock in terms of getting people out to vote. And that's true. Well, robocalling, 0% correlation when you statistically, scientifically analyze the effectiveness of getting someone out of their house and vote. Making volunteer calls to, again, who are likely to be like-minded, so it's independents and Republican homes using the voter records, you can actually build your organization and even using robocalls. It's best if you have volunteers call because you have this personal connection. It's all about relationships, right? You're calling again. I'm a concerned neighbor. It's the same script. I'm concerned about these big government politicians bankrupting us, our children, etc. The challenge will typically be going door to door as well as these phone calls is to move on. Okay? Because these people have all this pent up frustration. They want to keep talking. So it's a wonderful opportunity to say, you know what? I would love to talk with you about this stuff because we share so much and we have so much in common. Come to our last, next meeting. We'll have a more relaxed environment. We can talk then, okay? As, because you need to move on. Make, keep making those phone calls. But calling as a volunteer, even robocalls, calling the likely, like-minded people in your neighborhood and informing them of meetings that you're having, etc., it brings people to the meeting. And uh, we've had a number of people in, in uh, Ohio do that and uh, across the country, actually, because we, we, Tom Zawakowski is a great Tea Party guy. He has 3,000 volunteers in one county, Tea Party volunteers. And he has a robocalling company. He's had this forever, and he's giving the Tea Partiers around the nation discount rates. Usually he charge about 15 cents a call. He charges 4 cents a call. It's bare bottom rates. You can call a whole precinct for $44. 60 seconds each call, so you can have a message. And this is on our website, but don't do it to get out the vote, do it to build your organization. Here's this one success example of, uh, of a tea party in Ohio. A 74-year-old gentleman, he wants to do everything first before he deploys it to his organization. So I kept telling him, look, Ralph, this works, you know, trust me. Okay, I'm gonna do it myself. So he did it one Saturday, Sunday afternoon, he said, I made 36 calls. He timed himself, 4.4 minutes per call. 15 calls connected, 42% completion rate. Usually what you will find out going door to door and uh, making phone calls, it's a 50% completion rate. It's been this way in the 40s. And uh, so when Heinlein talks about in 1946 about precinct organizing, he uses the same numbers. 30% 30 uh, 30 primary, 60% general elections. And that's why it's so, uh, it works. Of the 15 calls, uh, of the 36 calls he made, you know, 15 calls connected, 11 were interested in joining his organization. And he even said, I'll bring neighbors, friends, I, you know, like-minded folks to your next meeting. And they have indeed come. And so he, he continues to make these volunteer calls, but he's also used robocalling and has had similar effects there in terms of growing his organization. Because people just don't know you're, you're, you exist. Getting out the vote. So, you know, what you want to do early on, like I said, is kind of like you lay the groundwork, you, you connect with your neighborhood, you find out who the like-minded uh, voters are in your neighborhood, see if you can't get them to help you with the, the neighborhood organizing, okay, and then uh, help towards election day. 
Come election time, it's go TV. That stands for get out the vote, okay? That's, that's the political lingo. And, and, and what you want to do is, is basically have three or four contacts with the identified like-minded voters in your neighborhood. And the way you do that is you go door to door once, you can make phone calls the second time, you can go door to door again, or make phone calls. So it, it, however you want to mix it up, okay? But keep it personal, on a personal level, uh, because these are your neighbors. And, and, and the reason there are three or four contacts is because you want to contact them once with absentee voting. You want to make sure they're aware. So that's your first point of contact. The second point of contact is when early voting starts. You want to get the people on your list. Like in my precinct, last, uh, in 2010, I had two, eight, 280 people. I had six volunteers. So, you know, there were seven of us, seven couples. So it's 40 people each, 40 households each that we were responsible for. And you want to get the group you're responsible for, those 40 households, to do absentee balloting. If they didn't do that, go to early voting. Go to the Board of Election. Take advantage of this. Then you can check them off, okay? Then come election day, you call them again if they haven't done the, the first two, and you say, hey, now is election time. I need you to go there. Do you need transportation? Do you need, you know, what do you need to be able to go and vote? You know, some, some organizations even provide babysitting, whatever, just to make sure those people are able to go and vote, okay? Every vote counts. And then there's this flushing the list, okay? Every, every uh, voting uh, location has to post who's voted at certain times in the day. And you can go there and look at those lists and check them off. You've, you know, so I've got my 200, my wife and I went there, we had our list of 280 people and we checked them off, okay, they all voted, and then we got back to our volunteers and said, okay, here are the people who haven't yet voted, who you're responsible for, call them, make sure they go out and vote after work. So that's four points of contact, okay, and how this works. Very doable. So how do you get started? On our website, thevoicesofamerica.org, okay, you go under approach, that's the main uh, tab and there's a sub tab called by step by step I literally walk you through the whole process of how to create a walking list using the voter records the walking list targeting the likely like-minded voters in your in your neighborhood and then all you need is a script door hanger and recruit some volunteers volunteers in order to get people to volunteer in your neighborhood they have to be asked personally okay uh, this was feedback I kept getting from leaders all over can't get volunteers. And I experienced this firsthand then when I, when I did it again in 2010. Couldn't get volunteers. I went to the local tea party, stood in front of them, said I'll be in the back of the corner, help me in my precinct. I stood at the back of the corner all by myself at the end of the meeting. Okay. <laughs> so I, I sent out emails to, I did robocalls to all the GOPers in my precinct and the tea partiers. Got one person, he said I just retired, wondering what I was gonna do, I think I'll help you. Okay, that's one. Then, uh, then I uh, got the list of the tea partiers living in my precinct. I sent them emails, no response. And so then my wife and I were talking, and I was really frustrated because I'm, you know, we spent a lot of time more and I on Voices of America with our travel and the website and all this kind of stuff. And I really didn't want to do that, but I'm, I want to walk the talk. So I personally experience all these dynamics. So when people tell me, you know, well, this isn't working or that isn't working, I can speak from personal experience, okay? And so now I had this issue of, this is what the guys have been talking about all along, can't get volunteers. She said, well, who have you been trying to contact? She took my list, within two hours, she had six couples who volunteered. She pounded on her door, knocked. First of all, you know, are you like, are you concerned? Are you like mine and all this kind of stuff where she wasn't sure, okay? But you know, if they belong to the Tea Party, it was a safe bet that they are. So I was like, my husband needs your help, okay? And he needs it starting like next week. He's done all this work. He's prepared a walking list. And all you need to do is go to 40 homes. Here's a script. Look, it's real simple, right? A, a one-liner with some maybe discussion you have. And then, and then uh, here's a door hanger he printed out for you. And if someone is in the home, you can hang that on there. Or you hang, use that as kind of a discussion item. Or you can give that to people because it had some of the factual stuff of why we are in trouble as a country, okay, from a financial perspective. And uh, she got six other couples just like that in two hours. So 
the learning here is you have to personally ask people to help and be very specific what you want them to do. Because, you know, most typically they're going to be really concerned about, my God, you know, he wants me to lead this big, uh, you know, event or whatever. I'm not ready. I don't have the time. No, be very precise in what you want them to do. It will work. But it has to be a personal invitation. In my own precinct, with six other volunteers, each of us going to 40 homes in our neighborhood, doing everything that I've talked about, we increased the turnout of conservative voters by 32 percent, 114 people that would not have shown up. And the one thing I want to do is pick people who've never done this before, because, you know, again, I want to experience this dynamic of picking novices, telling them to go to door to door. I had no training whatsoever. We just gave them a script the and the addresses and the door hangers and said, go for it, okay? And they did. And they really got into it. And then they send me emails. I forgot to ask them for feedback. I was so busy with everything else. Suddenly I get these emails, which, which in itself is telling. They were so, you know, energized by the experience. They want to share this. So I get, overall it was a positive experience and I got to be relatively easy to do once I got through the first few houses. Okay. You know, you got butterflies the first two houses, all right? That's understandable. You've never done this before. You're knocking on doors with strange people. That's okay. But look, after a few first few houses, hey, I'm in a group. This is fun, particularly when you get into, I saw 35 out of 39 homes assigned in the past two days. I was thanked by many homes for doing this, and only one home said they were not interested in what I had to say. Good experience, and I joined doing it. Of the 17 that were home, I got 15 yeses. Probably half the people I spoke with thanked me for going out and canvassing. Really appreciate the opportunity. If I can help with any future efforts, please call. I did get 28 of the 32 called yesterday. Great experience. Many thanks for calling. Many had already voted. So that was a, after the flushing the list, I had them call to make sure those people indeed did vote on election day. All you have to do in your neighborhood is identify the like-minded voters and you use a stack deck by using the voter records to create a walking list of the likely people who are likely to be like-minded. Very easy. The organization as a whole, uh, like the Pennsylvania Tea Party, can help the individuals in their neighborhood who do the organizing by coordinating across precincts uh, and also coordinating capabilities that are more suited for central deployment, like volunteer phone banks, if you don't want to call from your home, uh, candidate nights, obviously an individual can't do that, voter guides, that's also better managed centrally, uh, leaflet creation, printing, etc. Uh, so there's a role for the larger organization, but each and every one in your organization, including friends, relatives, etc., need to do neighborhood organizing. Everyone needs to get involved here. You know, the reason I'm doing this is because I'm an immigrant. I've, you know, my family came here for a reason. They wanted to get away from socialism and, and, and have their children experience American exceptionalism and realize the American dream. And, and that's why I'm doing this, okay? We don't charge speaking fees or anything. I mean, we, we're dedicating our lives. I put my private business on hold, and same with Warren, and it's like, this is important, okay? This is, I'm giving back. It's a calling. A lot of people say, oh, it's great you found a passion. It's not my passion. I'm a chemical engineer by training. <laughs> Never believed that, okay? Politics was the last thing I could imagine getting into, and I have no intention of getting into it other than facilitating these trainings and making sure as many people as possible understand the importance and power of precinct neighborhood organizing and you know relative to the sacrifices that others have made such as the soldiers dying for preserving the freedom here this is nothing I mean this is minuscule rel relative to that what I'm asking you to do and you know and, and, and Winston Churchill has a very great quote along these lines if you will not fight for right when you can easily win without bloodshed, and that's right now, okay? We can win doing precinct organizing without bloodshed. You know, you may have to fight when there is no hope for victory because it's better to perish than to live as slaves. It's kind of interesting, you know, road to serfdom, he's using slaves. Everyone seems to know, based on history, where, how these things play themselves out, if not stopped. We have a chance to stop it.